thank you, Yanni, and uh, thank you, everybody who's here on the panel, and welcome to uh, New York City. Now, the signature statement from Wilson and Wilson is this. Selfishness beats altruism within groups. Altruistic groups beat selfish groups. Everything else is commentary. The other point needing mention is Wilson's emphasis on the design principles of Nobel Prize winner Eleanor Ostrom, who showed that holistic systems can be self-sustaining without one element exploiting another as long as certain design principles are involved. Wilson proposes that, also selfish, that although selfish economics, selfish business, and selfish politics settled Ostrom's work to the sidelines, it becomes paramount once again if mainstream science has decided that group and multi-level selection choose altruistic structures and processes and not those that are dedicated to self-interest. In short, Wilson concludes that altruistic evolution leads to utopia, as we see, he shows, in the balance of our world's natural ecosystems. Human evolution, on the other hand, so far, because of our faulty narratives, has led to dystopia, the very morass that is addressed in Stephen's book. Obviously, there are already clear parallels between what I have just said and the entire structure and content of Stephen's book, Sacred America, Sacred World, and a short list may help us get started. The general thrust of Stephen's book is to lift America from what he calls America 6.0 to what he calls America 7.0. That is, out of its parochial, singular, sovereign place in the world to its place in a healthy, global civilization. This transition is obviously, one, governed by the laws of group and multi-level natural selection. Whereas, as Stephen says, the definition of fitness for America would be its processes and structures that actually serve the whole, the whole world and the global civilization. So from the beginning, from the beginning, Stephen's book, subtitled Fulfilling Our Mission in Service to All, is about a transition wherein the degree of our altruism would be the degree of our ultimate success, even perhaps our own survival. David Sloan Wilson's book puts this subject matter in Stephen's book squarely in the realm of scientific fact. At any rate, it is this discussion of what is possible and perhaps what is even required that brings us to the table today to discuss the evolutionary altruism paradigm and sacred America, sacred world. I particularly appreciate when you were talking about the, the framing that uh, that, that within a group, com competition can lead to more success, but between groups and ultimately altruistic group leads to a greater evolution, outperforms the, the group. And, and in many ways, what we are at now is, is at this juncture point where some of the founding codes and the ethos and, and the, the culture that the America has created are starting to reach the, 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 the glass ceiling, if you will. We can't actually go to the next level of our evolution as a country unless we rewire some of our values and belief systems and some of the hyper-individualistic competitive paradigm is now turning self-destructive in different, different ways. We have a time of um, great division, the political divisions are as exaggerated as they've ever been, except perhaps the Civil War. We have race and class divisions that have, str have gotten stronger and stronger. More and more people are locating in smaller communities that can be very sympathetic within the community but are increasingly suspicious or hostile to outside forces. And so, and so we get these pockets that are becoming anti-evolutionary within, within our culture, which includes our dominant uh, political parties. And so, th so as Americans now, we have to say, what is, what is, how do we start to shift the energy up to a next level of expression? And for me, Sacred America, Sacred World is, is about this deeper marriage of a spiritually based altruistic, globally centered, holistic paradigm applied to the political journey of the, of the United States. And it's a natural outgrowth. It's in many ways, what, what, the paradigms that we've inherited got us to where we've been 
for, for better or for worse. And those paradigms were very competitive. They were, they were hyper-masculine in certain ways. And now we've gradually had to integrate other cultures, other ideologies, other perspectives to keep expanding the compass of our hearts and keep expanding the range of, of people that we take into, take into consideration. And it is, it is a global era. We have, have global internet, we have global media, we have global culture and finance. And so for us to believe that we can simply put up border, put up walls and wall out the world, it's no longer, it's no longer a realistic proposition. The, the health of the whole of the world will impinge on us no matter what we do, whether that's a disease that's sourced in uh, West Africa like Ebola that can spread or it can be financial crises that metastasize from the other side of the world. That, that, that security and thriving and happiness is contingent on now on the good of the larger whole because it's these pockets of the least evolved, most uh, oppressed parts of the world that can do the most damage to where we are. So we can't simply go backwards and, and retreat and create more of the boundaries. Uh, the evolutionary imperative is to go to the next level and, and to really do so in a way that, first of all, is grounded in a sacred respect and honoring for all of life and all of the other individuals that are here on this planet. And that can sound really good and lofty, but can be challenging to put into practice because, first of all, it's, you know, we can get very righteous with our opinions and our beliefs, and we can tend to begin to look down upon, judge, critique, and then even demonize and vilify the other in different ways. And it's particularly evident in our political process. And so one of the things that I, when I wrote this book, I really wanted to create something that could get endorsements and advocacy both from the left and the right and people who are at this leading edge because ultimately people th there there needs to be space within the vision of where we're going for all people to thrive and if people are feeling excluded in one way or the other or that their viewpoint isn't sufficiently acknowledged and honored that they don't feel seen that tends to rise up as antagonism and polarization that's part of where the antagonism in our culture is so sourced right now so putting this down to like a personal story level, uh, one of the things that I've been sharing a lot in the different media things I've done with the book is uh, my own journey of recognizing how I needed to expand my, the compass of my own heart to include political leaders and positions that were, I, at first were very distasteful. So 2008, Sarah Palin was the vice presidential candidate and she really was like nails on a chalkboard for me. I, I, I thought I'd done a lot of meditation practice and inner work, but I really hated her at, when I saw her on TV. And so instead of just dwelling in that and rehearsing that, I took it as an opportunity for practice and to say, how can I get beyond my own biases and stop casting her out of my heart to see that she has legitimate right to be here and that the people who support her also need to have their view of reality held within a larger whole and that can't happen through the rejection. And so I, I, I read both of her books and people are like, really, you sat down and spent all that time. And in that journey, I really humanized her. I found the places of shared humanity and upbringing. She was kind of in North, in Alaska. I grew up in the north woods of Minnesota. Some of that G shucks down homey kind of energy. I was like pretty similar to people that I grew up with. And I could, I could even, I could identify more with the guns culture because a lot of people I grew up with hunted for, for food in the winter and different, different times. And so there was a way it humanized her. And at the end of that journey, I didn't become more conservative, but I became more accepting and, and empathetic. And I wrote an article at Huffington Post about this called Dissolving the Palin Prejudice that actually got a lot of traction, got a lot of fan mail from conservatives and, you know, frankly horrified some of my progressive friends, but it actually taught me something important about being able to hold the space and the context for, for in which everybody is seen and respected. And that's part of what we're really lacking in our culture right now, that we have to operate from that place of, of unity consciousness where we're unifying at the core, because the, the best of America has to be born from holding the polarity of unity and diversity. We're not all gonna suddenly start thinking alike, but it's like, but when we ground ourselves in the place of connection and deepest, um, deepest respect, that that actually softens the divides. We begin to see each other as human beings and, and the polarizations that, that can be potentially destructive and even violent begin to see, be seen as more constructive, that the diversity becomes an asset for the generation of new ideas and new perspectives and new philosophies and new solutions. So I found this particularly helpful in thinking about political evolution to not just 
stand in my more traditional progressive orientation or even just an integral framework, but to try to like spend some time looking at issues from a whole different set of values and priorities. And it gives you not only a different way to look at things, but it also gives a way sometimes to language things that can be heard and received because people's, you're speaking from somebody's value system. At this very moment, over at the United Nations, uh, people from all 190 member states are wrestling with transformative change and how we might move into the future with, a, as they would say, a world that works for all. And that includes future generations and to some extent the, the larger ecological systems or ecosystem services that enable us to live a good life. And so these, these efforts to sort of look at uh, evolution or development as sustainable development um, from a Wilson perspective, from Phillips perspective, from a lot of other perspectives, we're really at a, a turning point. I, I think as we look at globalization, I mean, the purpose of the, of, of the UN is to create peace, to find a mechanism for resolving conflicts that doesn't involve war. That was its primary purpose. And then to, to, to create a baseline of human rights that would, uh, you know, that would be respected by all, all countries. Uh, and we haven't gotten very far in either one of those. And then, and then in the third thing really became, came in in the 70s, 80s, which was the environment sustainability, sustainable development. And what's, what's sort of happening now is people are realizing all of that's interconnected. I was very happy to hear that you wrote the book on Secret America, Secret World, because I'm a big fan of your shift network. Mm -hmm. And I found, as a media person, looking into how different aspects of society, especially media, since media is part of our nervous system, will be becoming part of that evolution. So mm -hmm. I remember how you started with uh, the movie and the whole network, how it started. So I thought you were doing such a wonderful job and how it grew and become very effective and uh, just amazing. I want to focus on this issue. I think, Kurt, you brought it up about the narrative that guides us because I'm talking at the United Nations on Sunday at a high level gathering and I've worked uh, quite a lot at the United Nations where from 193 countries the narrative always seems to begin with self first or country or the particular identification with a positioning. And I have a very simple understanding of the word sacred and if I apply it to America in as much as I am coming to know it in a new country, although I'm from England originally, um, when something spiritual occurs in a place, it always provides new human permission. And one can say that a place that has been spiritualized is from that point sacred, sacred space. And I'll take one set of words which to Americans is probably like a second intuition, but to me stirred me so deeply was a new birth of freedom. And I dwelt long and hard on those words because one birth of freedom which the Civil War seemed to, seemed to be about was coming out from under the yoke of slavery and suppression. But Lincoln seemed to live the Civil War inside himself and saw far beyond that to a new birth of freedom where each human saw each other as unique with the unique birthright of the same rights and permissions uh, and that that had never been really, hmm, there are exceptions perhaps, but it had never really been uh, realized on Earth. And this was a permission for humans to move into. 
the gift of David Sloan Wilson's book and of your book is starry-eyed as it might be, as both might seem to be on some level, is a vision. And without a vision, the people will perish, you know, as Isaiah says, or writes. And so what's, I think, so important about your book and, and what David's work is about as well is helping us, helping put out a vision, and then people will catch it. They'll see it, mm -hmm. and then it'll come into their heart eventually. And then they'll be able to, as you say, do political cross-training. <laughs> you know, I love that term in your book, where people actually are willing to find out, as you did in reading Sarah Palin's book, why is she, who is she, and where do we come together rather than where are we different? What's interesting here is our ability to go back referring to the science and then to uh, the, 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 the sacred. Everybody now in science who looks at the journey of humanity right now as an anthropological threshold, how uh, we as primates who have totally embedded us, the clan, the leader, the ego, the chest thumping, you know, everything that's a huge part of just millions of years of our, of our evolution, and a history of our time on this planet in nations, in languages, in religions of just completely different narratives, how we go to a healthy globalization actually is probably going to define whether we go extinct or not. Well, so, so many rich comments from all of you. I, I more want to drink it all in. Um, I'll say a few things that just struck me. Is I think it's what's really key you're to ask about modalities for where we come together. I think we have to find the places where we can align around a shared vision or mission or goal. There's the macro level as a whole country, and that's part of what I'm trying to art articulate in the book of like there's a macro vision of what America can become. But in order to build the, the practice of finding the unity, you have to find that place of unification, a, a superordinate goal, to use a more psychological term, that we're working towards. And I think the other piece is what you were pointing out, Richard, is that there's um, there's in a way of honoring of sacred lineage that there's that even like whatever Americans or transplanted Americans are coming here, we're, we're inheriting a stream of possibilities. If we see that from a different angle lens, it's disclosing new freedoms, as you said, which I thought was, was beautiful. And that, so you think even the founding fathers were themselves actually carriers and expressors of something still deeper. You know, the Masonic lineages and esoteric lineages, Rosicrucians coming out of Europe and the deeper Iroquois Confederation and their templates of creating a federated uh, system between nations that was peaceful. So in many ways, the Founding Fathers were ta drinking in from the Enlightenment streams in Europe and, and the native peoples and creating a new hybrid. So, so the, the streams that we're actually manifesting that we share are, are much deeper and that when we, when, we, when we recognize and honor that lineage, that actually creates some shared commonality of bond, you know, whether it's like me with a Sarah Palin, like we could talk on that level at what, what you just said about Lincoln and, and the Gettysburg Address. That's a place that we can bond and find common humanity. And if we're acti activating a vision in the future of where we can go together, I think that creates sufficient social glue, if you will, to, to wrestle with more of the difference of opinions about how we navigate the, 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 the current reality. So we have to find both the unity in the past and the unity in the future to navigate the, the diversity in the present. And just one final thing is that I, um, that's been coming to me more lately is what I would love to see is, is Sacred America, Sacred World gets enough traction that then there can be a Sacred Canada, Sacred World, Sacred Australia, Sacred World, Sa Sagrado Mexico, Sa Sagrado Mundo, that people from different countries take it on almost like chicken soup for the soul ended up franchising out into a bunch of different directions. Because I believe that each country has a very unique part of the the practical and spiritual puzzle of what's the deeper gift and blessing to humanity that it's manifesting as well as the unique challenges to overcome. And that could be uh, that, that, that when we can, and when we can get a portal into that from somebody who's within a culture and has a deeper grounding in, in its unique blessing, I think that starts to, that starts to create like a very interesting constellation of visions that are, that have, um, that move 
within the symphony of the, the sustainable de development goals and then the unique cultural expression towards that. So I, I just want to honor that, that the evolution within this field that's created here is is was very generative and I feel that there's that that is part of part of the dance where we're demonstrating the that when it's not about idea competition but there it's like it's like a it's a dance more like uh, improv where where it's you say yes and you don't say no to what somebody throw when somebody throws you the improv you say yes to whatever you just got and build it and grow it and I feel that that's that's a great modeling that that is uh, altruism in in micro, micro miniature mm -hmm. where where we're, we're added, adding adding value to each other rather than really really just you know somehow feeling like we need to diminish others in order to enhance ourselves so I just want to honor that and honor each of you for the depth of inquiry and heart and soul and intellect too the marriage of the heart and intellect in each of you is quite profound and and I think that is ultimately ultimately when I talk about a sacred America sacred world the reason part of the reason I like sacred is that we it's a, it's a term that we associate with our hearts mm -hmm. that we can create the space for brilliance of mind but that but that we find that unification in the sacred heart of humanity and so that's uh, a place that I honor all of you for for your gifts as well. Mm -hmm.